Hello everyone, my name is John Thine and I've got Peter Haley with me. We're both directors in the forensic section of uh, Vincent's. And what today we're talking about is the fundamentals of business analysis. Now, with the, um, the session we've got on, um, what we're trying to achieve is just to actually take a step back and look at um, really the, the basics of fundamental, uh, basics of um, uh, business analysis. So the group we've got today, we've got about half-half between accountants and lawyers. Um, for some of the um, some of the sections we go through, I, I apologise to some of the accountants there. The um, some of the stuff will be fairly um, fairly basic for you, but at the same time, I think quite important to actually revisit those fundamentals. Um, so if you can just bear, bear with us through those sections, we'll move forward fairly quickly. So the first the first thing I want to um, go through is just the outline of what we're talking about today. Um, with, the, with any sort of uh, business analysis, the planning stage of what we do is, is really the be-all and end-all. Without proper planning, the, um, the outcome usually is very expensive and can really go off the rails and not get the result you're actually physically chasing. What we're going through today is the purpose of the analysis, understanding the group structure, um, what source of information are, should be and are available to actually do the analysis and are they sufficient to do the analysis, using accounting data files, looking at trend analysis and analytical review, and finally going into looking at some business benchmarks. So firstly, the purpose of the analysis. This section, these first couple of sections, I should say, are extremely important in how to actually move forward and should the, the importance of this should never be understated. I won't actually use all that fun animation on, on this, these slides, but so the first step, define the purpose of the analysis. What are you physically doing it for um, is the first step. So valuation, um, damages, fraud, so if the accountants um, a due diligence, agreed procedures type review, um, that purpose is extremely important and that will actually um, frame how you actually do your, your plan. The next one's a little bit of an odd one, but again, one of the really important steps, you almost need to uh, visualise the end goal before you can move forward. What are you physically trying to achieve? So if you imagine your forest, you've got to actually work out the destination before you actually physically set off to the forest. Um, and that way you can actually define what's the actual most appropriate path on the way through. Once we know where we're going, the next stage is to understand what we're looking at. And that's where we start looking at the, for, for businesses, we start looking at the structure, um, what the physical business is and the actual inter interrelationship between the actual group. Once we've got our background, we move on to planning the analysis. We know where we want to go, how are we physically going to get there? What information is available? then diving into analysing the information. Now what we, we, we see from time to time, and, and this is probably more from the forensic side of things, where we see um, someone's actually brought an action against somebody else um, for horrendous fee and not happy with the outcome, is that the, in this type of area, and it's probably in that sort of due diligence type um, space, is that um, the actual practitioner who's launched into doing the analysis have gone straight into the analysis. They've started at point F haven't actually started at point A and worked their way through. As a result, they've gone in, they've just started looking at information and started going in all these different directions and almost been a little bit can't see the forest of the trees. We do our analysis. Point G, that's really as we're going through our analysis is always keep a commercial focus um, and consider are we actually getting to our end goal. Um, this probably comes up a lot when we're actually looking for uh, unreported cash or looking for hidden assets, we launch into it, we're looking for um, the, the representation is there's, you know, there's, there's material levels of cash that haven't been disclosed. We dive in and start looking at it's a mechanic store and we're, we're, we've gone through, we've looked at all the parts registers, we've looked at how they physically do their procedures and um, we're coming up with yes there's a little bit of cash that's indicating there is a little bit but it's really looking at about 20 grand. Um, we're looking at fairly insignificant sort of levels. At that sort of point, if we're not coming up with a, um, a real indication of high levels of cash, there's no point in, in proceeding. Instead of actually you know, going on and doing 10, 20, 30 grand investigation, if the outcome is not looking like it's going to be there, at that point you need to start pulling up commercially, is it worth moving forward? That last one I'll just reiterate again, never just launch into the analysis. It's really important to actually have that plan on the way through. The plan is absolutely everything. So we start with our group structure. 
we, we know where we're going, we now need to actually understand what we're physically looking at. What are the entities in the structure? Why has it been set up that way? And that's a really important one, actually understanding what are the various structures, the various entities within the structure, what are they used for? Um, and why are they using it that way? Is it asset protection? Is it to actually um, put the, the risky operating venture in a separate entity? Um, whatever it might be, it's actually trying to understand why the actual structure has been set up that way. What's the interrelationship between the entities? Um, so you'll see um, you know, things like inter-entity charges going through, you'll see um, admin fees, management fees, service fees, whatever they might be. How are they being, um, why are they being paid? How are they being paid? What's the, the structure behind their, their costings? And try to understand again um, how the, the relationship works. To gain that sort of information, the primary source of stuff, the first place with, with accountants, um, we put everything in the financial statements, trying to understand through a more trend analysis, which we'll look, look at shortly, um, how have things happened in the past and how they're happening right now. So actually understanding the income expenses and the assets and liabilities, the loan accounts, the um, how, again, how things have actually moved across. Obviously a big part of it is looking at AIC searches. Um, and, and again, we use this example very shortly. There's a lot that can be gained out of ASIC searches that quite often we don't look at. For instance, we will look at the shareholders and directors and potentially any past shareholders and directors. We actually don't usually go into all of the information that's been lodged in the past. So changes in shareholdings, why, who did them, what were they beforehand, what documents we lodged with the ASIC. A lot of that's um, able to be obtained and if you're doing a full investigation, it's very handy. ABN searches, so just diving onto the, the um, uh, business names uh, website, looking at the ABN um, numbers that have been issued, you can get a fair bit of um, information straight off the website. And obviously discussions with the parties, discussions with the accountant, discussions with lawyers, um, even going as far as um, insurance agents and the like. Whoever, whoever actually may have information on what's involved and why. Do a quick example. Um, this is a, a matter I did. Um, I was probably about five years ago now, um, which was it was the biggest matter in this type of analysis I've done, and it and it blew me away at what can actually be done in, in entities. The client came to to talk to me and said, "Look, something's not right. I had an employee who's worked with me for ten years. Um, I gave him five percent of the business as an incentive." Um, it, it turns out that I actually, over time, have actually now given him 50%. I wasn't aware of that, but I accept that's actually physically happened. So here's our structure. So I've obviously changed the names. We've got an entity called Business Name, P2LTD, with ACN, triple zero, triple zero, triple zero. It owns a business. Business Name is owned by Smith Company and Jones Company. Jones Company being my client. We start looking at ASC documents, and, and this one was interesting. We spent uh, somewhere in the order of, I think it was $25,000 in getting the, um, a, the company searches done, but also getting all of the supporting documents that have been um, previously done and actually getting certified copies of those to ensure that they were the real, the real version. Um, once we started looking at these documents, we found that Smith Company was the only one that had an interest, so Jones was out. Um, there had been a change of ownership, I've changed the numbers here, but occurred on the 8th of February 2012. Business name is now called Hollow Company. The name of the business is owned by business name P2LTD, but business name P2LTD has a different ACN number. There is a new company that has the name business name P2LTD, it owns the name. And the ownership structure of the group has changed, so if we, just to recap, that's what we had previously, so business name triple zero, triple zero, triple zero. It actually owned the business or operated the business, owned and operated, and we have our two shareholders. By doing the analysis, we now have this structure. So we've got Smith and Jones down the bottom. Jones holds nothing, whereas he thought he held 50%. And previously we, we held the interest in business name P2Y LTD, um, triple zero, triple zero, triple zero. So you'll see now that Hollow Company has that ABN, so that's obviously a business name change. Hollow Company now owns Holding Company. Holding Company now has 100% um, uh, interest in a unit trust, and that unit trust holds the business. And business name Peter LTD, which is the name of the, the entity we used to hold, now actually is a different ACN number and is actually acting as trustee. 
Now this was the top left hand corner of a huge structure and it was really quite, you know, from a nerdy accountant's point of view, a really quite an interesting exercise to do. Um, but it just shows what can physically be done. I should point out, if you have any questions, by all means um, just type a little response on your screen and I'll be able to see them pop up here. So now we're at the stage where we understand the group structure. Now we can actually start collating information. So what source of information do we look for? Now obviously everyone starts with the profit and loss balance sheets and notes the accounts. They're a really important area. What it suggests there is you need at least the last three financial years and, and very importantly the financial year to date. We also need income tax returns, BASAs and assessment notices. Now the reason we need those, one they actually give additional information we haven't had previously but they also um, show that the, you'll be able to see the, the initial part of the, the tax return, the actual accounting profit that's been put through. That accounting profit should marry up with the accounts you've been provided. So it's almost a test check as well. The next area is internet searches, ASIC, uh, property data. There's property data you can, you can pick up very easily. There's other services you can um, through um, uh, RP data, yeah, there's other services we can actually physically get and pay for, but there's a lot of um, public available information now. Websites, Google searches, there's, there's amazing levels of information to be gained from the actual businesses' websites. Who are the participants, what's their background, what are they advertising? Um, we did that one the other day, that the, um, there was a um, motor mechanics business saying, it, look, it, it's having a really hard time, um, it hasn't actually been able to um, produce any um, real sales the last couple of years, we jumped onto the website and we saw that they were actually selling um, hundreds of thousand dollars worth of vehicles and these were projects that actually bought cheap cars, done them up, souped them up essentially and were selling those. So they're right, they actually hadn't made a lot of external sales but were by choice because they were working on their own vehicles. So the Google searches and announcements, there's an amazing level of data that's actually available online now. Statutory documents and agreements, so if there's um, constitution, partnership agreements, um, shareholders agreements, whatever it might be, management agreements, and management created documents. So we, the, the first four points we looked at there are external data, then we start looking at the internal data. Depreciation schedules, debtors and creditors, age trial balance, stock ledgers, customer summaries, and the list goes on, payroll records, whatever it might be, bank statements, check butts, internet um, transfers. The list is, is endless, but basically anything is kept in the actual, um, in the office. And just remember, you know, not necessarily all this stuff is relevant. It just depends on, you know, what is the, the purpose of the particular analysis you're doing. So, um, as John said, you know, if it's a valuation, yeah, maybe you would get into all this sort of stuff. If you've got to value one party's shareholding, for example, you'd want to see the shareholders agreement. You'd want to see the franchise agreement if they're, you know, part of a franchise and whatever. But don't, um, we're not suggesting you need to go and get all of this stuff whenever you're doing any sort of analysis. Again, keeping in mind that commercial reality check that you've got to always, you know, um, I don't think I've ever been given a job where I've got an open checkbook and they just say, oh, whatever it costs, it costs. So you've always got to keep in mind you've probably quoted a fee to do the analysis of the job you're doing and that's part of the scoping exercise right at the start and maybe that's one of the steps we should have had on that first slide is, you know, for the, uh, um, and that's certainly where you get caught up in a lot of due diligences and things like that where you quote a fee and you realise the job's a lot bigger than you think and to do the job properly um, you just can't do it for the fee and the client doesn't want to pay any more and that becomes a real practical problem. So, source of information continued. Um, so I've looked at the, ob the obvious areas of, of information and the internal areas. Never underestimate the, the power of actually just talking to people. And the valuations we do um, approximately 80%, and, and if we can, we, we do, um, approximately 80% of the actual valuations we do, we actually go out and actually do a site visit. We talk to the actual the principals, we can see exactly how they're physically operating their business, and it's amazing the level of um, information you can, you can glean from actually just kicking the tyres. The accountant is always a, a good area, the solicitor and uh, insurance broker. Um, the insurance broker um, insures all of the assets, so what are they being insured for? So does that marry up with what's on the, the balance sheet or the valuation that's there? The financier, the financiers, you know, if they're making um, uh, credit applications, they're going to be putting in credit, uh, essentially details of their business, how it's physically trading, um, where they actually physically see it going. If you can actually get discovery of the financi uh, financier's notes or the actual physical application itself, tremendous. 
but also looking at um, things like the credit approval letters of offer. Look, the list goes on. Um, a lot of this is back to the accounting data again, general ledger, accounting data file, bank statements and associated documents, um, data mining technology. Um, so this, as I said, is, 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 is huge. These are probably the more obvious areas to actually start considering is it relevant. The data mining is an area that actually is coming more into the fore. Um, and I might just pass over to Peter just to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so as you can see on the screen there, yeah, the um, output examples of what you might get from the data mining is comparing your data against your external data sources. So, you know, comparing your accounting records to bank statements, making sure the reconciliations are done. Um, one th we've actually got a, a tool we developed which um, works specifically on MyOB and it does all these tests, but there are some off-the-shelf ones that essentially if um, the accounting program is just a database at the end of the day, it's, it's a database of numbers, the off-the-shelf data mining tool pretty well convert those databases into a format that they can read and then you can do your analysis. So um, whether you go out and get one if you're not doing a lot of this work is um, probably open to question, but it's something to be aware of. So the sort of thing we do, um, for example, if it's um, a fraud analysis, so you might do a credit or ABN comparison. So what our data mining software does, it actually launches itself into the ABN register and so in the accounting system where you've entered all your creditors that you're paying, you also enter their ABN number. Uh, what the data mining software does is checks that those ABNs are legitimate and you know, it's, it's, it's just a straight check against the, the um, government's register of it all uh, to see if any of the creditors are fictitious essentially. Uh, the same sort of thing with the duplicated employee. So the data mining software will, in the, within the payroll module of your, of your program, will essentially do a, a, a matching exercise against addresses, um, phone numbers and particularly bank accounts. So everyone gets paid by um, direct transfer to their bank account these days. So if you've got two employees with different names but they're both getting their pay put into the same bank account, then you um, would suggest that maybe they're one and the same person. Similarly, with um, it will also check their tax file numbers. Um, what it also does is, so if you're looking in for fraud, sorting records sequentially and identifying gaps, so for example sales invoices. So maybe a legitimate sales invoice was issued, uh, but a staff member has pocketed the cash, they've then gone into the accounting system and deleted the invoice. So rather than you having to go through manually and see if every sales invoice is there in um, numerical sequence, the, the data mining software will go through and do that for you. Same sort of thing, sorting transactions in ascending and descending numerical order. Uh, measuring frequency of similar transactions, so payments to suppliers. So um, you can ask it, you know, if you typically pay your creditors once a month, if um, some suppliers have got 13 or 14 payments to them in a year, why is that? So what the data mining software will do is just raise red flags. It won't necessarily give you the answer. You'll have to go back to source documents and in this case, you know, your supplier's invoices, you have to get the phys you actually physically pull the, the file of supplier's invoices and see if, well, for some reason, yeah, we did pay them twice that month, or is that extra payment a fictitious payment? It's been posted in the accounting system as being paid to, you know, Mr. Supplier, but has the payment actually gone to the, the fraudulent staff member, for example? Uh, it also searches for duplicate transactions or data fields, so if you've got, uh, similar to the payroll one, you know, if you've got two bank accounts, the same name, number that you're paying to. Um, you can identify changes in the size, volume, nature of transactions and for example the payment frequency. So that might have a, a perfectly legitimate ex uh, explanation. So your, you know, your monthly photocopy of rental increases every year as, you know, as part of the agreement for example. But ordinarily if you've got things like leases and whatever you'd normally, normally expect them to be the same every month. And the last one here is uh, quite an interesting thing. It's a, it's a measuring of a, it's called a digital occurrence against mathematical distribution. So a fellow called Benford, I don't know when it was, but at some stage in the, has um, developed this law. If you can just um, 
what the law basically says is that for any database of numbers, there should be a spread similar to what that dotted line is. So um, don't ask me why, but this is obviously someone's PhD or something that they did this and they found and just did it on you know, hundreds of databases and found that on average you'll get that sort of spread where you'll get more numbers at the lower end and less in the higher end. And what the, bar, the coloured bars are on that graph are the analysis of the particular database we're looking at. So in this case, it's an accounting data file. So for some reason here, we've got a lot of transactions where the first and second digit of any payment started in 5-0. Um, what you often find here is, uh, the one I can remember actually doing in practice, a lot of them ended, it wasn't the 5-0, they all in, um, started in 4-9. And why that was, that the certain staff member in, um, in question had authority to make any payments up to $5,000. So all the fraudulent transactions were always for 4900 and something. And that's what came out in this database. Again, it doesn't provide the answers. It just gives you a, a bit more, you know, trying to find that needle in the haystack. Sorry, so I'll just go on now to, um, and this is one area where we probably apologise to the accountants in, in advance, um, just to explain to the non-accountants what a data file is and what it does. So what we've got here is a sanitised version of a MyOB file from a client. So for anyone who hasn't ever used MyOB, I'll try and make this reasonably short, but just to give you an idea of the sort of things. So across the top are various modules that you can go into. Um, sales, purchases, payroll, you can see all that's in there. So what that, as I said, you, if you run the data mining software, you can run it on the payroll module, for example, if you're trying to find duplicate employees and things like that. Um, just an example of some of the um, reports you can run off if you're doing some sort of analysis. So everyone thinks on oh, an accounting system, that just does um, a um, yeah, profit and loss statement in a balance sheet is what you get out of an accounting system. Well, that's that's not actually quite true if you've got a computerised accounting package, which this is typical of. The so I'm just sorry, John's driving the mouse here, so I'm just trying to get him to. Um, what we've got here is a list of all the account transactions for the check account, which is account number one 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 two zero up the top in the middle there. So this is essentially a duplicate of your bank statement, is what this thing would be. So um, if you haven't got data mining software, what you might do for this is just, as John's doing, just scroll down quickly and just look for, whoops, there's a big one, $25,000. Um, that's the sort of thing you'd be doing there if, you, if you've got to do it manually rather than having any sort of data mining. So, and then, so what the report tells you is, you know, it's a, it's a general journal. It was done on the 14th of August, 2006. But it, if you actually do a double click on that little arrow over on the left hand side there, it actually takes you into that journal. So you can see that the other side, what we're looking at from that first screen was the, the entry to the check account. The other side tells you it went to the Metway check account. So that's just um, in a car, an accountant's talk, that's called drilling down within the MyOB file. But that's where the um, having the electronic data file rather than the old days when we used to be given you know, photocopies of the general ledger printout, for example, and you'd have to manually go through all this stuff and then try and trace back to the journal. It's just so much quicker and easier if you've actually got the electronic version. Um, the other thing I'll just show you quickly that's good is um, you can also do things, John, if you're just going to account um, multi-period profit and loss. So you can do things like a multi if you're doing some sort of analysis and you want to say, well, you know, has this business that we're looking at, is there any sort of seasonality in it? Do we do, you know, sales at a particular time of year? So, for example, I remember doing a kitchen goods store year, um, recently where about 70% of their total sales for the year were between the middle of November and the 24th of December. So, if you're analysing that sort of business and you only were given a six month profit and loss statement until the end of December, that's got the vast majority of your year's sales in it. So 
if you're looking at, uh, for example, you had a full year's result, a full year's result, and then six months, you might think, oh, well, this year is going to be a, um, a really boom year because if we double what we've done for six months, we're going to get much better than the previous years. But if you do something like this multi-monthly profit and loss statement, you can see where the actual, you know, the volume of the sales is. The other thing you can also do with any of these reports out of MYOB is to export them to Excel, for example, and then you can do, you know, beautiful things. So we'll just do that now. We'll just an export to Excel of that. And it's essentially the same thing, but what you can then do when you're in Excel, you might say, well, for the purpose of my report, I'd like to illustrate that. I'll create a graph now of my total income across the year. And then you can just create something that, um, you know, if you're trying to make a point about something, to illustrate the volatility of the sales in this case. That's what we're trying to, uh, that might be the point you're trying to make, that there doesn't seem to be any particular um, consistency or whatever within the, the, um, the sales. So anyway, I think that's all I'll um, talk about with the data file at this stage, and I'll hand back to John to, uh, for the next section. Next thing we want to look at is, is probably a fairly fundamental thing that we do on any form of business analysis, whether it be a loss assessment, a business valuation, or an investigation. And that is actually to get the raw data, raw accounting data, and actually put it into a trend analysis with some analytical review. Now again, accountants, will, we apologise for this, and, and for quite a few of the lawyers as well, you've seen what we've been doing here. Um, this is an example we've got for widget manufacturing. Co. Now this was actually a, a real matrimonial matter I worked on quite a few years ago, but it was, it was just a really good example of what's there. Um, the, the facts have been changed slightly, but the, the actual numbers are, are correct. We have a business that's been trading for approximately 20 years. Standard trading terms with suppliers and customers about 30 days. In June 2009, the director exits the business, or the wife. In June 2011, that director advises um, that he or she wants to sell this shareholding. There's been no material changes uh, in the way the business has been operating, um, and you've been asked to value the business at 30 June 2011. So we've asked for, we've collated all our initial information, um, particularly our uh, financial statements. And the first thing we do with those is to actually put them in what's called a trend analysis. That's what we've got here. Here's one I prepared earlier. So here's the the um, profit and loss statement summarised for the 2011-2013 year. Now, the, one of the important things here is we're using a trend analysis. So we're not just looking at one year. We're looking at multiple years, putting them in this trend analysis so we can compare each of the individual account items. So the question I've got for, for you, based on the the assumptions we had there, we basically have business trading for 20 odd years, very consistent, been trading well um, with growth every year. So in this case here, um, what do we physically look for? What we quite often do is we, we get all this information inputted and then we literally sit down with a ruler and actually put a ruler under each of the lines. So what do sales tell us? We've been told that the business is trading relatively consistently with a steady growth, so 405, 425, 2013, we're not getting growth. So a little mental note, we're not getting growth. So sales is the first line. The next line, opening stock, 80, 90, 80. So we're seeing a fluctuation in our stock. Moreover, we're seeing closing stock, 90, 80, 70. So we're actually seeing we're actually, this is a business that actually has falling stock levels. We have gross profit margin, 270, 275, 230. So again, we're seeing a, a, a reduction in our gross profit for the 2013 year. So the, the flags are starting to fly that something's happening in 2013. Um, so if we're um, just looking at the physical numbers, we'd say the business is trading in a harder type environment in 2013. Something's happened to this business. If we're um, being sceptical, we'd say that the person who's running the business is, is either running it into the ground or is reporting in a way that would appear to be it's running into the ground. So again, these sort of things, are, the flags are starting to go up. No income, no other income, which is very convenient. Then we start looking at the various items. So this is where we'd actually start putting a ruler underneath. Accountancy, fairly consistent, wouldn't notice anything there. Advertising, 1,000, 1,000, 1,500. You'd sit there going, whoa, what's happening here? So one of the first things we do in, in an interview type situation is to actually talk to the director who's running the business saying, what's going on? 
in this case here, the director says, look, what we're trying is our sort of our in inverted commas Woolworths approach. We're trying to drop the actual price of each of our units to win additional market share. We're also spending a fair bit of money on um, marketing and promotion. So we're trying to actually build our presence, drop our unit price, and increase our sales volume and therefore more profitability. So we go, okay, that's an explanation, we'll see where we go. We start going through various things, appreciates a little bit up and down, nothing too exciting. Insurance is up, we don't ask that question, is that just insurance costs going up or is there something else there? Lease expenses, something's gone up, we've leased something new, what's that? Again, these sort of questions we'd ask on the way through. Materials and supplies up a little bit, given constant sales volume, why it's not really that big though. Motor vehicle expenses are up. Why is motor vehicle expenses up? Um, does that have something to do with our lease? Again, going through, nothing overly exciting. Woo, here we go, salaries. 21, 21, 102, what's going on? Um, we've been out there and done a site visit, we know there's a storeman, so who's this other person? We talk to the director, that's the, um, the marketing person, so the marketing person's really getting out there and, and selling, so again, we've had to start spending some money. Okay, fair enough. Superannuation, $50,000, that doesn't look right. Um, as you all know, superannuation is now sitting at nine, was 9%, nine it's gone up to 9.25% of what the actual wages are for uh, most employees. So 9% of $50,000 is not 21,000. So there's additional amount going into, um, sorry, other way around. Um, there's additional amounts going into superannuation. Um, being a privately held it, um, company, you start thinking that there's probably going to be, um, in this instance, money going into the shareholders or directors' um, superannuation account. That could be in lieu of wages, but what we're thinking is there's going to be a superannuation fund sitting on the side. It could be an externally managed one, it could be an internally managed one. One of the structures that, we, that was very common, went away and now is very common again, is that the entity may actually have a self-managed super fund which invests in a trust. That trust buys a, a business property and borrows money to do that and rents it back to the business. So what we may have here is actually another property, a couple of different entities to value. So just keeping your eyes open as to what might be there. Then we go down to the bottom, operating profit before tax, 147, 148, we're making a loss. So obviously 2013, things have been blown out of water. We've got a reduction in gross profit margin, we've got an increase in our expenses, increase in our salaries, um, which is the largest cause to our increase in expenses, but we're now trading at a loss. So the question there is, is that real? Is that really the way the business is going? We're also noticing that no um, tax has been paid in the 2013 year. And that's obviously a, a direct consequence of there's no profits being derived. So the next thing we look at, we've done our profit and loss analysis. We go into the balance sheet. Again, it's the same trend analysis. We're trying to find anomalies that are there. So we go down through these, cash bank, not a whole heap there. Trade debtors, we're noticing trade debtors have increased but have remained relatively constant. That may be a little bit at odds if we're actually um, selling more, more units at a lower price, I'd probably expect We'd start seeing some fluctuations here. The loan W widget. So that's the director who's working the business, or the old husband. Um, he's gone from 30 to 105, 180, 205. He's taking a lot more money out of this business than he is in salary. Uh, we don't know actually if he actually is receiving a salary. Um, but that, that amount there is a, as an asset, there's two things there. One, W widget owes money to the company. And two, for those of you who have a tax background, and most accountants will, will have that, um, we've got a Division 7A issue. There are some tax consequences here. We're going to start looking for commercial loan agreements. We're going to start worrying that unfranked dividends are going to be declared in those years or should have been declared in those years. So again, these, these alarm bells going up, and if we're doing evaluation or investigation, those are the things that need to be taken into account. We're seeing stock levels decrease, and that's a little bit of odds again as in, in relation to We've been told that we're doing the Woolworths concept, we're selling more units. Now those units are costing us the same, so if we're selling more units, the same cost, we'd, start, we'd ex expect that actually our, our stock holdings are increasing, not decreasing. So why have they decreased in the 2013 year? And so what we're trying to do here is to explain, we're trying to look at the numbers and say what story is that telling us? We're trying to understand the story. Um, by understanding the story, we can actually, or think we do, we can look at the various permutations, we can actually start doing investigations in those areas. No changes in plant equipment, 
motor vehicles, our motor vehicles actually dropped off, which if you remember back in the profit and loss statement, we actually had an increase in our motor vehicle costs. But we also have this lease expense, so one of the things we're going to be looking at is what's the motor vehicle cost and is it likely to be that lease that's there. Um, if we haven't actually got a, the asset for the, the actual lease motor vehicle in there as an asset, it means we're not going to have the liability there and essentially we're looking at a balance sheet that has another asset and a liability. Now if it's a new vehicle and the chances are that you drive a, you know, a $30,000 vehicle out of the showroom, that vehicle as soon as you drive it out is now worth 25000 but the liability is still at the full amount. So there potentially is negative equity in that asset, which are, again from a valuation viewpoint is important. Office equipment hasn't changed and there's some odd, odds and ends which um, whether they have value or not you'll deal with them accordingly. We're looking at the overdraft, it, overdraft initially started increasing then it was repaid and now has come back in full. So we're now at $53,000 as our overdraft which obviously is an indication of um, cash flow. Is there a cash flow problem that's happening in this business? Is that partly to do with the loan to widget? Is he just drawing extra money out of this business? Trade credit has been fairly consistent, although it has actually started to ink up just a little bit. Again, is that an issue we can't repay our people? Higher purchase liability is being repaid. So again, that sort of supports the fact that there, there may be another lease with the actual motor vehicle that's there. GST liability is consistent. Provision for income tax has disappeared. That's again stemming from the loss for the current year. What we're coming up with is net assets, 4,107, 211, 205. Um, so we can see there's an increase, that's essentially the value of the entity, save any adjustments to the assets and liabilities that are there. But we can see that the actual value is, is still sitting there. Interesting though, what you'll note is that our net assets in the final year are 205 and if we look at our primary receivable, we've got loan W widget 205. So essentially the value of this entity sits in that loan account. So where to next? The next step is to actually look at analytical review. And this is start, we're starting to do um, ratio analysis of, of the actual um, profit and loss in the balance sheet to see what combinations we've got there. The first one is, is the most simple and should be done in every single analysis. That's our gross profit margin. We divide our gross profit by the, by the actual level of sales. Now for most businesses that's a relatively consistent percentage. It may drop slightly, it may increase slightly, um, but it should be relatively consistent. What we're seeing here is the actual gross profit margin in the 2013 year has dropped from 64% to 54%, which is a major drop. So again, our flag's gone up as to why has that physically occurred. The directors told us that it's this Woolworths principle that we're selling our items at a lower um, sale value. That's consistent, but I'd still be looking further into that. Net profit margin, I mean some of these aren't relevant in this case, but net profit margin is what's the net profit divided by sales when you see a loss in the final year and again the return on the total assets we've, we've produced to a negative position in 2013. The activity ratios are extremely important. The activity ratios tell us how long it takes to do something. So for stock days, how long does it physically take to turn over the stock in our warehouse? Debtor days, how long does it physically take to um, collect our debtors and creditors, how long it physically takes to pay? Now stock days, we can see stocks decreasing from 231 to 207 to 140. And again, given our Woolworths principle, I would have thought that would have increased given that we're now selling a greater volume of, of stock. Debtors and creditors, keep in mind that our, we're, we're trading on standard terms of debtors and creditors of 30 days. So we'd expect our debtors to actually pay within 30 days. So this number should be 30 and our creditors to be paid in 30 days. We're actually an increase in our debtors days, so it's almost three months we're doing a decrease in our creditors, which both are at odds. Why aren't our debtors paying and why are we actually paying our creditors faster? If there's clearly our overdraft is blown out, is there some form of um, problem with our creditors? And it may be that we've actually defaulted and we've, on some creditors are actually requiring us to pay cash. And our debtors may actually be not paying um, because there's some problem with the stock that we're physically providing them. Liquidity ratios tell us how liquid the actual assets of the business are. And it's, it goes down to those sort of um, insolvency analysis, can we pay our debts as and when they fall due? Our current ratio is basically telling us um, broadly, can we pay our current liabilities out of our current assets? So 
because literally it's just our current assets divided by our current liabilities. And as a rule of thumb, that's usually we'd like that up around two. Important thing to notice, note with this particular case, though, of course, is included in our current assets is that loan from uh, to W Widget. So probably if you're doing this analysis, really you should exclude the related party loans when you're doing that, or have some sort of guarantee. You know, he has got the funds to be able to repay that at any particular, you know, at a moment's notice if need be. That's an extremely important um, point with all of the actual current assets is to actually look at how current they are and again the current liabilities, how, 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 how much you know, the liability is there or when they'd have to actually physically pay them. So again, if we go up to our current assets, we've got current assets 381. How do our current assets look if we take out the loan to W Widget? Suddenly we're actually in a bit of trouble. You know, we'd, that comes down to 176 compared to our current liabilities of 127. A quick ratio is a, is a, um, a harsher test. Um, it looks at our, our probably our more liquid current assets compared to our um, liquid current liabilities. And then the leverage ratio is looking at essentially debt to equity type, type information. Um, so looking at their, the raw numbers, they're, they're raising some flags. The current ratio is looking okay, except once you actually do the, the adjustment, we're probably raising more flags there. To cut to the chase, when we actually did our adjustments, our operating profit coming straight up our, our profit and loss statement. We valued this business as a valuation. We valued this business on the basis it was um, on a before financing basis. So we added back all the financing costs. So that's the interest and the leasing costs. However, the, this is where the first, first real adjustment came in. The, um, the, the lease that had been leased, um, entered into, that was actually for a new Mercedes four-wheel drive which was probably a little bit over the top for a, uh, a marketing person. That marketing person also turned out to be the director himself. He started paying himself instead of taking as much cash out of the business to actually start affecting the, the profit. Um, bought himself a new car and he was driving around seeing customers in that. What we've said here is when actually valuing the business, what does the business need? The business needs a, it did, did need a vehicle, a sales, sales car to go around, but something like a Commodore was fine. So he sort of said $30,000 five-year write-off, so it was $6,000 a year in depreciation. We made a few inquiries in relation to the sales, and as it turned out, and this was something the, the husband actually volunteered, um, in, 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 a little bit caught out, um, was he actually had been pulling $25,000 out per annum um, to um, pay the maintenance to the wife. And then in the final year, he started getting a bit greedy and really up the ante. Um, so part of that gross profit analysis, this Woolworths thing was a was a an absolute crock. That wasn't the case at all. He was trying to feed us lines. Um, what he actually was doing was actually taking more more cash out of the business, not declaring it. The other thing that actually happened with that sale, because you know the sales dropped in that final year, um, the additional stock there was stock in transit. There was a truck actually had left the supply and was on its way out. Um, there was twenty thousand dollars sitting on a truck. So when they did the stock take it at year end truck wasn't there. It was in the purchases. The purchase documents had been entered into the accounting system, but the actual closing stock wasn't there, so it wasn't included in the stock take. The final adjustments we've made here, we've put the um, director in there at a commercial remuneration. So we've added back um, his superannuation and wages he had been paid, which is that first line, and then we've taken away, you'll see down the bottom, a commercial salary for him and, and superannuation. We've added back other benefits he's received, which included um, sickness and accident insurance, um, the excess motor vehicle benefits he's receiving, the advertising, you would notice advertising jumped up to $17,500. $16,500 of that was legal fees for the matter. He was running with his wife. There was donations also in there. We normally add donations back on the basis of the, of the goodness of the heart donations. Um, don't actually affect the trading forms of the business. And, and really, a, a, it's a payment from the director um, at his discretion, it doesn't really actually affect the actual trading performance of the business. We added that back. So the interesting thing at the end, from a, a maintained earnings point of view, we went from 153 to 150 to 130. Now, there was clearly a drop in the actual physical trading performance. However, it just wasn't trading at a loss. When we actually did the adjustments, it improved um, dramatically. Okay, just on the home stretch now. So just um, 
a quick word about use of business benchmarks. So if you're doing any sort of analysis, um, the problem with analyzing small business is there's very little um, readily available data out there of comparable businesses. So unlike property valuers, for example, who can go out and do an RP data search or you know, a titles office search, there's um, very little in that way. So the nearest thing we've got to get any sort of um, useful information to compare this business to how it, because um, obviously there's so many different sorts of businesses out there, um, you know, we haven't necessarily seen every sort of business before. So obviously there's some sorts of businesses you do tend to do more of. So um, for example, we do a lot of bank valuations for the, for the finance purposes of um, IGA supermarkets and pharmacies. So we've got our own internal benchmarks on those and you just, you know, see one every week or two and you just know how those businesses operate. For businesses that you don't really see, you, know, you might do a valuation or an investigation once a year of or every two years, the nearest thing you can do is some sort of get some sort of industry averaging. Um, so I'll just get, um, we'll just bring up an example of the sort of report that you do get. Um, and this one's for accountants, which we thought you might, um, if you don't already do that sort of thing, find interesting. So the sort of thing that a, a benchmarking thing will tell you is they normally break up firms into you know levels of turnover and sometimes you get some sort of geographical break up um, and then it's just a matter of finding you know, in which category your particular firm you're analyzing falls into and then trying to compare it to these benchmarks so the important thing to remember with benchmarks of course is though that the um, they are averages so there's always a range the average falls somewhere within that range. The range could be very wide. It could maybe could not. Accounting practices, you'd probably say, I would think the range would be reasonably um, narrow. Most firms would trade, you know, reasonably close to this. I mentioned pharmacy before. That's one that does, uh, for example, things like gross profit margin. If you're trying to analyze a gross profit margin, um, just the way the pharmaceutical benefits scheme works, um, it's very difficult for a pharmacy to sort of over or underperform um, markedly on its um, gross profit margin. Where you do get variances in a business like that is if you have a, um, a pharmacy like a Terry White, they're typically about 50% of their uh, turnover comes from front of shop, you know, from the perfumes and toilet paper and whatever, and 50% from scripts. So they'll have a different gross profit margin to a business such as a what's called a medical center pharmacy. So it's a pharmacy that's you know, parked in the front of a medical center, which has a very small sort of range of non-prescription drugs, and they might have 80 or 90 percent of their income comes from just um, filling of scripts. So they'll have a, a different gross profit margin. So that's where it's important to understand the industry, going back to our very first steps in terms of doing any sort of analysis. So if you pulled up pharmacy benchmark, these figures would be a mixture of the Terry White type pharmacies and the um, medical center pharmacies. So you get an average of those two gross profit margins. Now Terry White probably gets a GP 30, in the mid to high 30 percent because they get a much better margin on um, all the non-drug stuff, whereas the medical center pharmacy, they've probably got a gross profit margin that would be 10 percent less than that. So you're doing an analysis, and this is just what I'm saying, you know, word of caution in using benchmarks. You're, you've got a Terry White type pharmacy in front of you, and it's saying GP, gross profit margin 38%. Your benchmark, which might be you know, of a, um, a mixture, all the ones in their survey they've created the benchmark from, might be equal numbers of Medical Center and Terry White, so they'll come up with a gross profit margin of you know, 33%. So you look at Terry White and say, oh, this is a great business. It's way outperforming the benchmark. It's got a uh, gross profit margin of 38%. The industry is only 33%. Whereas if you were analyzing a medical center pharmacy and you said, oh, its gross profit margin is only 28, when the industry is 33, this isn't a very good business. Well, they're probably both fine businesses within their little um, part of the industry. So within the, there's industries within the industry almost in terms of the particular niche they fall into. So that's just the main word of warning I'm just trying to make with that point. Um, just don't, you know, they are an average. 
Um, you can see, for example, so I can't highlight on this because it's a PDF, but um, if you see down just with the, the um, hopefully you can see the cursor, staff salaries are in a, you know, there's still a reasonable variance there in terms of um, somewhere hovering around either side of the old, you know, third or third or third rule for accountants. Um, all the accountants out there probably know that, you know, it used to historically be that uh, when you're running an accounting firm, a third of your turnover would be spent on wages, a third would be spent on overheads, and a third was hopefully profit to the owner. Um, you can see as you, your salary percentages actually go higher when you get up into a higher turnover business. And the reason for that might well be that in those higher turnover businesses, the, um, maybe the partners are on salaries themselves. The, um, and also you end up with um, you know, more um, overhead staff in terms of the bigger the beast becomes, you tend to find that um, you suddenly need a HR manager, you need a, um, you might have a marketing manager. You've got all these other bodies that um, get covered by someone else just working harder in a smaller firm and that's part of the explanation why your salaries are, as a percentage of sales anyway, are higher in those other sort of firms. That's really all we wanted to go through today. Um, the, um, the biggest thing we, we put out there in relation to the um, uh, business analysis is plan, plan, plan and have a commercial outlook on what you're physically trying to do. Um, it's really important actually to get the, um, the purpose at the outset, understanding what's going on and get the right information first. Without those three steps, the odds are that it's actually not going to be a very good outcome. Um, and from a litigation viewpoint, um, they're the probably the professional negligence claims that come through. That's what we're seeing is where that hasn't occurred and the actual answer being um, achieved is incorrect. But um, as I said, that's, that's all we, we uh, want to talk about today. If there's any questions, I'll, we'll stay online for a little while and answer any, um, um, anything that comes through. So by all means, um, type some questions. We actually did have one question come through earlier. Um, hi, Peter and John. Who runs the data mining software process and what sort of costs are involved? Um, we've actually got a separate section set up called Vincent's Fren uh, Forensic Technology. It's headed up by um, one of our directors, Dan Haynes. Um, now he's, the data mining side of it is, is a very small part of what they do given that the, um, the large part of it is actually um, attaining uh, data, data out of actually storage devices, whether they be computers, um, the new iPhones, the smartphones are an amazing source and big buzz at the moment. There's so much stuff being done on iPhones and iPads and the like, but actually gaining data sources. The data mining is used as a, as a tool in analysing the actual data that comes, comes out of those things, whether that be our MyOp data or, or some of the other um, uh, software that is available. But also they use things like email um, type analysis where they can actually do amazing things with searching for email information. And just something on that that um, those guys can do, they actually take a forensic image of a computer, which means you actually get you, that computer. So if you've got a piece of accounting software that is yet, um, you know, not widely used and you're trying to do an analysis on the business, well, maybe you don't need to go out and buy the, the software necessarily. If you can get a forensic image, if the client's friendly, um, then you can basically download their whole computer onto your computer and create a virtual machine and then you can just operate that machine rather than having to be out of the client's premises the whole time, um, run reports, do whatever you want to do on that um, and do the data mining, for example. And this area, from a, you know, a purely accounting viewpoint, I always find interesting, they, they work on a no-touch policy. The actual, um, when they get the image, they actually take the computer apart. They actually don't go through working the computer and down, downloading like we would. They actually take the computer apart and actually take the storage device out, copy it and put it back. So there's no way of actually knowing someone's actually physically been in there. It's, it's, um, it's all cloaked and dagger sort of stuff. But um, again, look, thank you. Uh, that's all we have to say. Um, we've got another webinar, I think, coming up um, next month. Um, but um, stay tuned. And again, any questions, um, please um, type those in now. Thank you.